Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the poor groves, and the moam wraiths outgrave. Lyric poetry challenges us to take what we hear, what we experience through our five senses, and to find a theme, find an overarching idea that gives us some sort of understanding as to what one singular idea the author was trying to capture. So welcome to this first installment of poetry, lyric poetry in particular, where I'm going to cover definitions and the context for reading and interpreting the poetry as we go through this semester. These characteristics, these skills are universal. They apply to freshmen, sophomores. They apply to adults picking up poetry and reading it for the very first time. So as you look at your literary definitions, we know that lyric poetry is relatively short. It's made of a highly charged nature, which means that the words and the expressions are designed to grab our attention, to to somehow touch something deep inside of our soul. I know that sounds a bit crazy, but the good poetry grabs us. It somehow reaches a part of us that we don't necessarily express on a regular day, and it causes us to become reflective. We know that a lyric uses a single speaker. One person, one persona, one attitude. And the ideas that that speaker expresses are their own reactions to what's going on. We know that lyric poetry comes from the Greek. It's based on the word lyre, L-Y-R-E, which was the musical instrument that accompanied the, the recitation of these lines. So the term lyric poetry comes from the Greek it has a musical quality, and it's known very much for the rhythm of the poem. So our goal when we read poetry is to pay attention to not only the lyric quality, the musical nature of the words, but the feelings and the ideas that those words evoke in us as listeners. So the goal here in this presentation is to present to you the idea of the ode, the sonnet, and the dramatic monologue. Two of these, the ode and the dramatic monologue, you've already had exposure to, but we're going to define it much more clearly in this particular unit. Presentation. I want to just briefly go over the goals for this session. Number one, the goal is to read the poetry aloud, to make sure that you hear it, I'm aware of what it sounds like, and really there's good connection between how you read the poetry and how that affects your memory and how, how the imagination is then able to kind of tie on to those ideas. Look at how the poet puts the poem together, how he or she chooses images, how she links those images to metaphors and similes, and how they present those particular concepts. That's the craft of the poet. So we get a sense of the literal meaning of the poem, what the author is attempting to do with the words, but we get a look at the larger significance of the imagery as well. What Wordsworth and Coleridge call the sensuous nuance. What a great term, the sensuous nuance. The, the idea that there's something deeper and we've got to kind of really try to get at it when we do our reading and we, and we start thinking about it. Really, this is the thematic implication of the work, but it sounds so much more interesting when you call it a sensuous nuance. So, as I flip over my notes here, we talk about how lyric poetry is driven by sound and driven by its musical quality. So, it's approach, it's lyric poetry approaches music, the sound, the volume, even the pitch of how we hear the words makes an impact on us as readers. 
Goethe said that a lyric poem never fully is realized until it is set to music. I do a lot of work with creativity and the imagination. I think the musical quality helps us to remember what it is that we're looking at more. It helps us to understand better the impact of our imagination. So we also know that in 1942, W.H. Auden wrote that poets make nothing happen. It's our imaginations and our responses to the lyric that make things happen. But 120 years later, Percy Shelley wrote that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. That the poets capture meaning and they capture understanding. But no one ever acknowledges that they really understand humanity and how we function. So our study of lyric poetry really is attempting to get us to understand how those ideas work. This presentation is designed to walk you through different pieces of how to put that together. So one of the major types of poetry is the ode. So in your notes, write down ode, and now I'm going to give you a definition. An ode is a lyric poem that expresses the intense feelings, such as love, respect, or praise for someone or something. An ode does not follow a strict format or structure, though it uses refrains and or repeated lines. Uh, an ode is usually longer than other lyric forms, other lyric poems, and it focuses on positive moods in life. So it may start sorrowful, almost elegiate in its presentation, but it gets to a much larger, more significant point as we move on. We know that odes are serious, they're emotional, they are about respect for a person or thing, and the speaker directly addresses the subject. So you've got four or five major characteristics of what the ode is here in this little segment. So you want to make sure that you write those down in your notes. So if I were to give you an example, you could go through and kind of write about that and think about it as we sort of moved through the particular material. So Percy Shelley, one of our British romantics we'll be studying in this particular unit, wrote us an excellent poem called Ode to the West Wind, where we get the opportunity to examine the function of a lyric. So I want you to listen and see what strikes you as I read this poem. Ode to the West Wind by Percy Shelley. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale, and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes. O thou who charioteest to their dark wintry bed, the winged siege where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow her clarion o'er the dreaming earth, and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and orders plain in hill. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, hear, oh hear. Ruminate on the meaning of what those words say. You may want to look up a copy of the poem in stanza number one where we talk about those ideas. But what about that poem grabs your attention? Does the west wind <clears throat> pardon me? Does the west wind bring death? Does it bring the cold? Does it bring winter? If it does, what do these things mean? Think about this and how the lyric and the importance of emotion and feeling contribute to these ideas. Anytime we talk about lyric poetry, as I had you look at in Ode to the West Wind by Percy Shelley, there are significant elements we want to concern ourselves with. So there are specific elements of poetry. 
such as figurative language. Figurative language is the simile, the metaphor, personification, automatopoeia. Again, simile, metaphor, personification, and automatopoeia. Words or terms that you use when you're interpreting the meaning of a poem. So a simile, uh, comparison using like or as. A metaphor is a much stronger comparison using usually to be verbs. Personification is when you give human qualities to an inanimate object. It's very common in lyric poetry. And onomatopoeia is words that are meant to mimic the word. So bang would be an example. The fifth major type is an oxymoron. An oxymoron is comparing two elements that seem to be complete opposites, but work well when combined together. In sonnets, we call this comparison between unlike elements a conceit. Uh, in metaphysical poetry, it's a comparison of two completely different objects. So all of poetry tends to use these same characteristics. Secondarily is the use of sound devices or repetition, alliteration, consonance, assonance, rhyme, and again, I already defined automatopoeia. So repetition is the repetition, if you will, of consonants and or vowel sounds. So alliteration is repeating the initial consonant sound at the beginning of words. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, or she sells seashells by the seashore. Consonants is repeating the final consonant sounds in a line or in a set of words. Assonance is repeating similar vowel sounds, A's, E's, to create that rhythmic quality. Rhyme is or can be internal and or external. Uh, internal rhyme means the rhyme occurs in the middle of the line. Uh, external rhyme means it occurs typically at the end. It's called end rhyme. So rhyme plays a significant role in how lyric poetry is formulated and how it works in its presentation. Now, we're going to see this in Shakespeare. We're going to see it in the metaphysical poets. We're going to see it in all kinds of different ways. So make sure that anytime you read, you look for those five sound devices. So how do you figure out lyric poetry? How do you figure out what a poem means or a song lyric means when you've never seen it before or you're completely bored or Manuel says you need to understand this and you're like, this is the dumbest poem I have ever read. All those things are valid and I get how that works. But I'm going to give you a couple of major strategies here to help you understand how to read lyric poetry. One, you got to use your senses. Lyric poetry is designed based upon your five senses and uses language and images that appear that appeal to those five senses. So you get visual images, you get sound images, you get uh, hearing. Depending on what the poet uses, it's going to affect how you respond to the actual content. So, for example, Given a poem, Ode to the West Wind, identify the imagery and how it is used. How Shelley calls the West Wind a cold force that comes in. Or in the poem that I read from Lewis Carroll, Twas Brillig in the slimy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. Well, we don't need to know what a slimy tove is to understand that it's an object that is gyring and gimbling, made up verbs in the way. So we can understand from our context and from the picture that we see what it means. How does the imagery set the mood? Is it happy? Is it sorrowful? How can we interpret what we're reading based upon that particular information? 
thirdly, and sort of the last question in this group is how does imagery point to the overall theme? If I read the poem, I should get a fairly significant idea of what's going on. And it shouldn't take me very long to be able to figure that out either. So there's a lot of information there. Number two, and this really the second one, uh, or the only one that I'm going to give you here, is analyze the poet's message. What are the poet's thoughts and feelings? What's the theme the author is trying to impart to you? It may not be immediately obvious. It may take a minute or two for you to figure it out. You may actually have to think uh, a little bit about the information. Do the thoughts and feelings seem true? Do you believe what the author says? This is what we called pathos in the first semester. Does what the author say or what the author says seem realistic? Is it fantastical? Is it imaginative? In what area would you sort of group what the author is trying to say? Do the speaker do the speaker's thoughts and feelings cause empathy? How do we, at the end of the poem, react to what the author said? Do we get the point? Typically, lyric poetry will sum up the main idea in the last stanza. So do we get what the author has to say, or do we have to reach for it some more? Does it take some time where we got to sit and think about it? In school, we don't get a whole lot of time to sit and think about it, so hopefully some of these ideas aren't too complex, but I'm still going to stretch you a little bit with these poems. Is the experience the author is trying to get you to authentic? Authentic is one of those tough words. Does it somehow drive us as people to pay attention? Hopefully it does. So as you kind of go through this exercise, as you look at these first couple of days of poetry, some major questions to answer, and I would definitely write these down in my notes. Where did the lyric poetry originate? Does it come from the heart, experience, something like that? Two, what's the difference between an ode and an elegy? What's the difference between an ode and a heroic poem? And three, what is the key to figuring out the particular poem you're looking at? What's the one idea you have to understand in order for it to make sense? These are the elements that you have to consistently look at as you are interpreting and sort of reflecting on how poetry functions. So let's talk about your takeaway. This is the first introductory lecture on lyric poetry, how it functions, literary devices, musical uh, qualities, all elements that you should be able to pay attention to. I was going to include a second poem here in the presentation, but I just left you with the opening stanza to Ode to the West Wind. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is can you when given a lyric poem, be able to talk about the theme, be able to identify figurative language, identify imagery, and be able to offer some sort of a conclusion about what you've been presented with. If you can do that for each and every one of the poems in this particular unit, you should be in good shape. So, moving forward. This is the first major set of tools in your toolbox. The next video will be about the sonnet and how the sonnet particularly and specifically functions in lyric poetry. So please continue on through the lecture series to make sure you have all of the information. If there are any questions, please see me. Please feel free to contact me and we'll be uh, moving forward. Have a good day.